Hey, just realized I want to start recording through Zoom as well as YouTube, just while we're getting started. So I'm going to start doing that just real quick. Gotcha, gotcha. Thank you. 
That was some beautiful music. Okay. If we're ready, um, yes, us, everyone. Hello, um, I'm Gregory Contes of Greek Ancestry, and I warmly welcome you all to the International Greek Ancestry Conference, sponsored by Greek Ancestry and the Hellenic Genealogy Geek. Over the next three days, we will all have the opportunity to learn lots of new things about history, family history research, innovative genealogy methodologies, and some awesome projects. 2020 has certainly been a challenging year for us all. However, perhaps one of the few good things that came out of 2020 was the advancement in the field of Greek family history and genealogy. Exactly one year ago, Greek ancestry was founded. Greek records became massively available for the first time and a series of educational programs ran throughout the year. What became clear throughout like our interactions with people over the last 12 months is the great interest and need of Greeks around the world 
now more than ever to reconnect with their family heritage and roots, to learn more about the history of their people and to advance their history, uh, research tools and techniques. Indeed, this conference has been organized to meet these very needs. And I would like to personally thank my friend, Carol Kostakos Petranek, who labored intensively for the organization of this conference. Um, thank you, Carol. And now I'm turning this to you, Georgia. Okay. Hi, everyone. I am Georgia Stryker Kyleman, the founder of the Hellenic Genealogy Geek Facebook group and blog. I am very excited to be co-hosting this virtual conference with Gregory Contos of Greek Ancestry. I'd like to take this opportunity to also thank Carol Kostakis Petranik for all her hard work. We couldn't have done it without her. I also want to thank Ben Soper, our technical specialist, who is the one who is going to keep everything working over the next three days, hopefully. I would like to introduce our first moderator of the day, Alexandra Gerizzi. She's a Greek ancestry intern and the author of Yaya and Me, the articles posted on Greek ancestry, which we all enjoy. Alexandra, take over. All right. Well, thank you very much, Georgia. Um, our first session is entitled Records and Repositories in Greece. Uh, it will help you learn how to use records to find your ancestors surnames and villages. And it will also cover what records you can expect to find in Greece. Please note that handouts for this session can be found under the conference tab on the Greek Ancestry website. The first presenter I'd like to introduce is Georgia Stryker Kielman. Georgia is the founder of the Hellenic Genealogy Geek Facebook group and blog. All four of her grandparents were born in Greece. Georgia's interest in collecting books and documentation on Greek immigrants began in the mid 1990s while working and living in Australia, where there was an abundance of recently published materials on the subject. Upon her return to the US, Georgia continued to collect books, articles, and data on the worldwide Greek diaspora. In the year 2010, Georgia formed the Hellenic Genealogy Geek Facebook group and blog to share all that she had collected with those interested in researching their own family history. The group has grown to over 27,500 members as of January, 2021. Georgia strives to encourage people to contribute by helping others and sharing information. Georgia's goal for the year 2021 is to create an associated website to complement the Hellenic Genealogy Geek Facebook group that will list and categorize thousands of links to websites, databases, articles, books, etc., of interest to people doing Hellenic genealogy research. Alongside Georgia, we also have Carol Kostakis Petranik, Carol serves as an assistant director of the Washington DC Family History Center, where she coordinates classes, conferences, and community outreach projects. She is an active member of the Greek genealogy community and teaches at local and national conferences. Her ancestors are from Sparta with three of her four grandparents born in Aios Ioannis and the fourth in Mistras. Her great grandparents are all from neighboring Spartan villages. Her passion for family history has prompted her to volunteer to digitize and preserve historic records in Greece, beginning with work at the metropolis of Sparta and expanding from there. Carol blogs at spartanroots.wordpress.com and writes personal and family histories. She's a volunteer at the Maryland Archives and the National Archives in Washington, DC. All right, um, so now we will begin, uh, Georgia. Uh, isn't it true that the first things a person needs to know before being able to successfully conduct research in Greek records is the family, is the village um, slash city of origin in the Greek surname? Yes. Before attempting to trace ancestors in Greek records, you must know the name of the village and the Greek surname and hopefully given name of your family. Mm -hmm. The past year has been amazing for Greek genealogy research, like Gregory said. MyHeritage.com released over 1,400,000 Greek election list records and 180,000 historic marriage records, along with backup documents from the holy metropolis of Monomvisia and Sparta. Also, Greek Ancestry launched a year ago, today's its birthday, 
by Greg, uh, it was hosted by Gregory Cantos and currently offers over 600,000 indexed and searchable records for various parts of Greece. These records do not overlap with the ones in my heritage. They have voter lists, mail registers, military lists, Greek state census records, parish census records, parish voter lists, Greek business directories, and more. But you know what? You still have to know the name and location of your ancestral village, along with the Greek surname used by your family to not only get appropriate results on these two sites, but also make contact with Greek archives or Greek administrative offices. First, the most important thing you can do is to interview all your living elderly relatives, not just your parents and your grandparents, but also all your aunts and uncles. If these relatives have passed away, Talk to all your cousins, not only the first cousins, but the second cousins. When their parents passed away, important records and photos were probably passed down to them. During the interview, ask the following questions. Determine the names of your grandparents and their parents if you can. Do they know the first immigrant who the first immigrant was that came from your family. Were any other relatives also in the US, Canada, Australia, or somewhere else? Do they know the village of origin? Ask for copies of any records, letters, or postcards and photographs they may have. This is much easier today than it was a long time ago when people held on to these documents and pictures because they thought they wouldn't get them back. Now with our iPhones, we can just take a picture and it's done. Were your ancestors married in the Greek Orthodox Church? If so, do they know which one? Ask if there are any other relatives living in the area that may not, they might not, uh, sorry, that you might not be aware of. You may need to have multiple conversations with these relatives because they might not be able to remember everything on the first interview. Remember, the more you share, the more they will share. So if you share some new documents or photographs with them, it may help them remember other information. Now, let me share the screen here, but just a second. I'll wait a minute. I'm going to put my, just give me a second here. No you guys problem at all. Can you see that? No? No. All right, sorry. Let me go to my screen and say share. I, I goofed that up. Share screen. <laughs> okay, how about that? Can you see that? Don't believe so. Carol, what am I doing wrong? Um, you clicked on the share screen button on the bottom. Yes. Okay. And did your screens pop up? Yes. And you click. You have to click on the one that you want to share. I am. Okay. Hmm. Hmm. All right. Um, are you going? Did you want to share the the charts that we made and some other things too? Okay. But that's all right, I can do it without this. Carol and I put together a chart that says before searching in Greek records, you must have an your ancestor's surname and village of origin. And what this chart has is on the left-hand side, a list of all the records and on the top, a list of what's included in the records like the spelling of your Greek surname, place of birth, date of death, uh, maiden name, marriage, occupation, residence, physical description, parents and children's names, and living relatives. There's an X in each of the boxes, which helps you understand what information is included in each of the records in the left-hand column. So that, this can be used as a reference but every record is not equal, okay? For the purposes of this discussion, 
we're going to talk about some of the records that can provide the most accurate information on Greek surnames and ancestral villages. So I will post this um, in the handout section so that everybody can see it whenever they want to. But what I've shown here is a um, Greek Orthodox Church marriage license certificate, okay? So many times, this is one of the documents that they kept in their home records. If not, you'll have to request it from the church where they were married. But in this particular one, it shows my paternal grandmother and grandfather. And there is a, um, and the name on it says Sarantos Stratigapulu, born in St. John's of Lacadimos and Georgia Babetsu from Theologo St. John's. Georgia, Ben's yes. gonna help with the screen share. Hey Georgia, yeah, I wanna make sure we can get that up and running. Okay. So when you clicked on your share screen button, it pulled up the list of your screens, right? And it let you pick which one you wanted. At the bottom of that menu, there should be a button that says share in blue, kind of in the lower right hand corner. Can we try that again just real quick and see if we can't get it yes, up? Yes, just a second. Let me go okay. down here. So it'll say. So you click on the green share screen, it'll pull up that little window that's got all oh, your, your share. stuff. Your okay, phone. that's it. I see it, share. All right. I think it's. And if I do the slideshow, can you see it? Just a second. Slideshow. Can you see that? Yes. Yes, we can. Yeah, okay. Like we're in business. Okay, guys. So here was the original chart I was talking about. You'll be able to see that. We'll post it on GreekAncestry.net, and we will also um, post it on Hellenic Genealogy Geek. Now, here's the marriage license we were talking about. We, my family never knew that the name was Stratagopoulou um, that my grandfather was using or that his family was using. We always thought it was Stratagakos because that's what was on all the records that we had. So when I went in and looked at Greek records, Stratagopoulou is the name that's used on those records. So it was very important. The locations, St. John's of Lacadimos and my grandmother coming from Theologo of St. John's, those are accurate. Okay, so that information is very good. Um, if you don't have one of these in your home records, you can order it through the Greek Orthodox Church where they got married. And that's why it's important to try to figure out which church they were married in when you're doing interviews. Now, the naturalization records, those are also pretty accurate. So this is a U.S. petition for naturalization. Similar records, by the way, exist in Canada and Australia. Canada's got a great system where you can see all of the records online. In the U.S., you can find them in many cases on a lot of the genealogy sites. They all have different ones. But if not, there's plenty of information out there about where you can write to get this. Um, there, I would also recommend that you try to order the entire package because in the package is a lot of, there are a lot of other documents, but also you might be able to find the one where they may have um, uh, put in a legal request to change their names. So in this particular case, on number one, my grandfather wrote that his name was Odysseus Tionis also known as Frank Tionis, which is what we always knew him as. Um, he was born in Capadelli, Greece. That's correct, okay? Married wife's name is Georgia and she was born in Sparta. And then down on number 11, it says that his residence in the US was at New York under the name of Odysseus Tionis now Frank Chonius and the ship that he came in on. So a lot of records will say, if the last name is different, it'll say that also, also known as whatever the name is. So this is a good source of information for finding out the surname of somebody that's changed their name. 
the passenger ship records. Um, this record should be used as a guide, as far as I'm concerned. Um, in some cases, the name may be misspelled or the residence location may be hard to read. It's a, it's a good place to start, but try to get confirmation in other records. In this particular case, though, it says my grandmother was Georgica Babetsu, and that she was from Theologos, which is correct. Now, I hate to say I love obituaries, but I do, because they can give you so much information. This is my aunt's brother. And he went by the name of James Carl. If you look down in the second paragraph, it'll say that he was born October 26, 1907 in Sparta, Greece. He's the son of John and Jenny Scarlatos. Scarlatos was my aunt's maiden name, which we didn't know until we could trace it down through all these different mechanisms. So, and also notice James Carl, there are no C's in the Greek language. So they really Americanized this, right? So, but the name is Scarlatos with a K. You will also find in many of these that there are um, maiden names, women, it might say Georgia, Stryker, in an obituary, and then in parentheses, Ne Babetsos, or um, uh, wife, you know, surviving wife, and it'll give her maiden name. So this is a great place. These, these obituaries give so much information. They give the children's names, my, um, on my Betsa side, there's an obituary that'll show the children change their name to best. So you can track that sort of thing down. And then, here we go, tombstones. Now this one's in Greek. I just love these old tombstones. Um, in many areas that had Greek communities, there's only one or two cemeteries that they used for most Greek families. Um, there is usually an area in the cemetery where all the Greek, old Greek tombstones are, tombstones are, and you can just stop at the front office and ask them and they'll be able to point you in that direction. Um, they also, now this one's in Greek, but look at, they, they have pictures on them. And this person is Vasiliki D. Carnu, Cartanu, her birthday. And then she's from Rizal, Arcadia. So a lot of them have the location on there, which, you know, is great. All right, let me exit this screen and just say that um, although I've only showed you a few of these documents, they can be very helpful. You may also find this information in like alien registration files, birth and death records, military records, passports, newspaper articles, especially the old Greek newspapers. And a lot of them have been digitized and are coming online or are online already. So now that you've collected all this information, you can now start searching in those Greek records we talked about earlier, and that Carol is now going to discuss with you. So take over, Carol. Yes, um, we're going to be moving on to Carol. Um, and Carol, um, people keep saying records in Greece were destroyed in the war. Uh, is this true? And what can I expect to find there? Well, that's a great question. I'm so glad you asked it because when I started my research, that was all I heard. All I heard was, you're not gonna find anything in Greece because all the records were destroyed in the war. Which war and which records? So the answer to that question is absolutely not. That is so not true. What a fallacy that has been perpetuated over the years. But until I started my research and until I actually went over to Greece, that's when I learned how um, untrue that particular statement is. So let's get everything straight. From the beginning of the modern Greek state in 1830, after the revolution, 
every village, no matter how small or inconsequential, was required to maintain information about its citizens. And we're going to talk about the records that were created um, regarding those citizens and why they were created. So let's also discuss right up front the reality. The reality is for Greece that there have been centuries and centuries of foreign invasions. And that has caused records to be in some, in some cases destroyed, but more often to be hidden in obscure places so that they were protected and saved and not found. And um, Gregory and I learned um, when we were at the metropolis of Greece, unfortunately could not go this past summer due to COVID, but when I was last there in 2019, um, we learned from the gentleman who I was working with to digitize marriage records that they would take these records and pack them on the backs of donkeys and haul them off to the mountains so that they would not be taken, they would not be destroyed, and they would not be lost. So stop and think about this. Stop and think about our country, our ancestors' country. Stop and think about the terrain. Stop and think about um, just here you are, just a, a humble people working the land, living your life, and all of a sudden people are coming in. Um, Ottomans are coming in, Venetians are coming in, Nazis are coming in. And they are taking these records and they're hiding them. So you know what happens and I know what happens when you take something from one place and put it to another, like sometimes it gets misplaced or sometimes things may get lost or, or um, if there are loose documents, maybe they fall out or get destroyed. So in that case, yes, some things have been lost. Probably a lot has been lost. In fact, I know a lot has been lost and I'll tell you about that a little bit later. But so much remains, so much remains. And what's so exciting right now is the work that Greg is doing um, and the fact that we're able to go over there now and access these records, especially the church records that we started with and get them preserved so that they are available and they're available not only for you to see, but they're available and preserved digitally um, and those digital images are given to the repositories whose records that we preserve. So this is just a huge blessing. The other thing to think about, about lost records is that in modern times, the governments have, uh, the government of Greece has undergone numerous administrative changes. So when they do these geographic administrative redistricting, they'll, they'll close one municipal office and they'll take all the records and they'll move them to another. So again, what happens when things get packed up and moved? Okay, maybe they do, some things get lost, maybe some things get destroyed. So stop and think that it's not just the war, it's not that people came in and burned, although that did happen in some villages, but that there are other factors as well. Um, the last thing to consider is who's handling those records. So we have the clerks in the municipalities, we have the priests, um, they're the ones creating those original records, writing them and putting them, you know, writing in books or writing documents. And um, honestly, I can tell you that as much as we treasure what they've done for us, they were not learned in preservation practices or in archival practices. I saw this firsthand when I was digitizing books for three or four summers at the metropolis of Sparta. I saw books held together with pins, straight pins. Um, I saw um, uh, thread with a needle, like needle and thread, like holding pages together with thread. Lots and lots of tape. And we're talking this old fashioned cellophane tape that turns yellow and dries out in splinters. And I even found a couple of books and church village books that were held together with contact paper. And some of you may not even know what that is, but back in the day, <laughs> It's a sticky, yucky plastic on the on the one side and like a glue on the other. And you would put it down like on your in your kitchen cabinets so that they wouldn't get dirty. I mean, I saw books held together with contact paper. So realistically, realistically, looking at the whole entirety of the situation, yes, there are records. Some have been lost, of course, and yes, there are, we see pictures of the Nazis coming in the villages and burning a church, absolutely. But predominantly, it's these other factors that have to come into play. 
So if there are records there, and if it's true now that we are able to access them, what exactly is available for you to see? So I am going to, um, right now, I'm gonna share my screen. Hopefully I can, this will work okay. And you can see in just a minute um, what is going on. This my screen. I'm having the same problem that you are having. Okay, hang on just a second. Let me try one more time um, because I want to show you a similar document to what uh, Georgia was showing. And I don't know if it's not, yeah, I'm having a problem here with this, my screen mm. share as well. So, okay. Okay, it says I'm screen sharing, but, oh yes, it did, it came up, wonderful. Okay, we're good. Really, because I don't see just, it. Yeah, there's just a slight, there's oh, just yes. okay. a slight delay, so I apologize. Looks good. Okay, great. So what we have here is um, the same type of form that Georgia showed you earlier. And she and I kind of created this together as a way to make it easier for people to understand what is in these records and what you're going to find. So um, let's take a look at the first line. It says, mail register, mitro renon. And we can see with a little check mark that in this type of record, we can expect to find the correct spelling of the Greek surname. We can expect to find a birth year, um, maybe a place and certainly an age. We can expect to find um, a father's name, not a mother's name, unless that Mitro Renon was created in the later part of the, of the 20th century. And we can expect also to find um, some additional information, particularly the residence where the person lived. So that's how this chart works. So you can see some of these records that have survived and that are available for us. So we've got the Metro Renan, we've got the municipal records of the Demotoloigen, and on and on and on, census records, city directories, et cetera. So what we'll do is show you some of these records so that you can see what it is exactly that you will be um, that you'll be looking for. Um, I do want to let you know on this screen that's coming up next is um, a document that has the links to uh, these different types of records, where they're found, and um, how you can how you can access them. So I am again. I'm not seeing that come up on my screen. There it is. Okay, I see it now. Yeah. All right. So consequently, on this particular one, you can see that we've got on the left hand column all the different types of records. In the middle column, it's where you will see those records, where you'll find them if you go to Greece in person. And in the right-hand column is a link to those records that are online um, or information about those records that's online. And the second part of this document is a mini description of each of those particular types of records. So these, um, this information that Georgia and I are sharing with you, as she said, it's on the Greek Ancestry website under conference tab. Okay, so let's go ahead and start talking specifically about um, some a very, very important fact that if you've done research in the US or Australia or something where records are, are pretty meticulously kept and you run into this situation in Greece, it throws you. And the situation is conflicting information. Now we all know that there could be conflicting information. There is conflicting information in a lot of documentation, but there's really conflicting information in Greek records. Two areas in particularly. One is the surname and the second is the age of the person. So what is it with our Greek surnames? Um, they didn't become standardized until the mid 1800s after the revolution and when the Greek state began to start keeping records. So, well, you know, why is it that you've got two people in a family and one person is called by one name and one person is called by another? And this is really just 
Now it's endearing to me, but at the beginning of my research, it was so frustrating. In Greece, when you meet somebody for the first time, they don't say, what's your name? They say, Poselena, what do they call you? So when somebody says, what do they call you? You can get really creative and you can give them your nickname. You can give them your um, your Paratsukli, which is the same thing as a nickname, just, just in Greek. Um, you can say, oh, they call me Nikolaos du Yorgu, Nikolaos, son of Yorgu, okay? It's Nikolaos, son of Georgios. Um, and then maybe that Nikolao du Yorgu morphs into Yorgopoulos, which eventually you get to be known as Yorgopoulos in the village. Um, you, there are these alternate names that families have are phenomenal. I have several families, including my own paternal grandmother, whose family goes by two names, Arida and Mihalakakos. Mihalakakos is son of Michael. Well, one of the earliest um, men in the family's name was Michael. So some people became a Halakakos. The Arida is a Paratsukli. It's a nickname. There was another person in the family who had big feet and long legs. And he got this nickname of Arida for long leg. So half the family's Mahalakakos and half the family's Arida. And neither of those two have any relationship to each other except that they're blood family. So you need to be aware that things like that will happen to you. Um, now, if you're not sure about your, your name, um, the spelling of the name, like I said, lots of times names are, well, names are spelled phonetically in Greek. Um, Greek Ancestry has a great tool. It's a spelling tool on the website under education. And just fill out a form and just say, I've been told that my family's name is this. Is that the real name in Greek? And um, they'll get back to you. Greg will get back to you and he'll give you what that correct spelling of that name is. So that's a really helpful tool. Okay, so what's with the ages? Um, I have alien registration files from people uh, here in the US that have, one of them has 40 documents in it. And in those 40 documents, the same person is giving her information with completely different, wildly different dates as to when she was born. And that seems incredible to us, but not so if you think about the circumstances of, of how our people lived when they were in Greece. They didn't celebrate their birthdays. They celebrated their name day, their saint day, the day that the saint was the name of the saint that they have. Um, and so consequently, a lot of people just have no clue when they were born. Um, you may find in US records that everybody, there's a whole bunch of people were born on January 1st, 1900. Um, why? Well, somebody asked for their birth date. They didn't know what it was, so they made it up. Okay, so whenever you're looking at any record, the first thing you have to say is who's the informant? Was it the person himself? Was it somebody else? Even if it's the person himself, the information may not be accurate. If it's somebody else, it may not be accurate. So the long and short of it all is that you are going to have conflicting information and just be prepared for that. Okay, let's move on now. And we're gonna talk first about civil records and then about church records. So civil records or government records are kept in two locations. One is the municipal office or the mayor's office or in Greek, Dimarchion. And the second is in the archive offices. And there are archive offices all over Greece. So you will need to search in both repositories. But from experience, let me advise you to start in the archive office. And the reason for that is simple. Archive staff are hired to help people. That's their job. You have a question, they're hired to help you. Municipal workers are hired to take care of the everyday activities in the municipality and whatever the mayor needs to have done. So if you come into a municipal office like I did in Kalamata and ask for a clerk to help you find a record from 1860, you're gonna get a look like, are you kidding me? When there are 15 people in line behind you waiting to get what they need for their everyday life or existence. Speaking from experience, I can tell you it's so different to go to a town hall than it is to go to an archive. So if you can, focus your first um, research uh, attempts in an archive. And what are you gonna find there? What are you gonna look for first? The three basic records for your Greek research, which are your town registers or your demotoloian records, um, your mail registers, 
and voting lists. But voting lists now, as of the last year, are online. And even before then, Georgia was working on voting lists, and we're going to get her to help us understand a little bit more about them in just a minute. So let's talk for just a second about the Demotoloyhin records. And let me bring them up on the screen. And a Demotoloyhin record was compiled in the mid 1900s at the municipal level. Every village was required to keep a list of its people. And these records are like a, um, they're like a census record, but they're not a census record. Um, a census record lists everybody in the household who lives there. A Demotoloyan record lists the people of that family. So that's, that could be splitting hairs, but not really. Think about all the census records you found that have border listed in or something like along, the, along that line. You're not gonna find that in a Demotoloyan. In this record here that's on the screen, you can see that families are listed by families, um, starting with the husband, the husband's uh, father's name and his mother's name, his year of birth. You're going to find um, information about uh, his occupation, his citizenship, if he's registered in the Mitral Renner or the mail registers, which we'll talk about in a minute. And going down the line, you'll see for each member of the family that exact same information. Now, there's one thing to be aware of, which is that, like with me, I found my grandmother's family in the Demotoloyan, but it was not complete. She and her sisters who had left the village were not listed. Only her one sister who still remained with her parents in the village is, in that, is on that Demotoloyan. But that seems to be an anomaly because on, um, for other families in the same Demotoloyan, I see all kinds of entries for children um, listed underneath their parents and then under current residence, it says America or Canada or Australia or Athens or wherever they move to. So again, who's the informant? Who gave the information? And in this case, um, whoever gave the information for that ancestral family of mine just chose not to include the children who had moved away even though they were part of the family structure. The other thing to think about is that um, data for these Demotoloyan are added continuously. These records are, are living records. So um, the one that we're looking at right now was created in 1955. And it was when it was first created, it was a static image of the families in the village in 1955. But people get married, people die, people leave. And so consequently, at the end of the book is where all the new entries are. So whenever you're looking at a Demotoloyan or you're looking at a town register, always, always, always go to the back of the book because you're going to find information there that um, uh, was not at the front of the book because it was added later. These records are found, as I said a moment ago, both in town halls and in archives. Um, you can get them now by sending an email to the archive office in your area and requesting a Demotoloyan record. But please be sure that you're asked that you know the exact village and the exact surname because what the clerk will do in the archive is they'll say, oh, in Amiklas or in Ios Ioannis, there's no family by the name of Capitaneos. And maybe you thought it was in Amiklas, but it was actually in Logastra. Well, the clerk isn't gonna look in all of these books for all these villages. They're going, to they're going to fill your request for what you've asked for. So you have to be sure your information is correct. Now, what are you going to do if there's no Demotoloyan for your family? What are, what's happened here? Do you have incorrect information or is something, what has happened? So my suggestion is to look to see if your family's surname was found in the record. Is that, is your surname appearing at all in that document? And if the answer is yes, then chances are that your ancestors may have left the village before the record was created. Okay, they're not there anymore. They left before then. 
So does that mean that you stop? Absolutely not, because you need to keep looking. If your surname is in that record, then that means that other people in the family are in the village. So write down or collect or take in, uh, digital pictures of all the surnames that are your surnames in that village, even if it's not your direct line ancestor. Now, what happens if you don't find your family name in the Demot Deloyen? Well, the answer is you may be looking in the wrong village. My home village is IOC Iwani Sparta. Do you know how many IOC Iwanises there are? There are three right around Sparta and thousands in Greece. So if I don't know not only the name of the village, but the exact location of that exact village, I could be barking up the wrong tree and I could be going to the wrong IOC Iwanis. So be sure that you have the absolute location. And remember also, sadly, in some villages, some of these records may be incomplete or lost, which is why your family um, is not showing up there. Okay, we're gonna move on now to the Metro Renon, which are the mail registers. And again, I'm going to share my screen and we're going to look at what a Metro Renon is. These are mail registers. They were created right at the very beginning of the modern Greek state, right at the end of the revolution, the Greek government was getting set up. And the first, there were two things that they needed. Number one, they needed money. So they needed tax money to come in. And number two, they needed their military. So these records were created to track men. When, who was born? When were they born? What village were they born in? And what's their father's name? These records are kept chronologically by year. And as you can see on the screen, it does give you, in most cases, the father's name, the year and place of birth, and later on in the 20th century, the mother's name as well. Now, the beauty of these mail registers is that they can provide the skeleton for your research. You find a father's name. The first thing that I do when I find my surname is I not only look at the first name, but I go through and look at the father's names for that surname. Um, how, how many times does Petros appear as the father in this Mitro Reno? Oh, he appears four times, okay. Who are, the, who are the sons? What are their names and what years were they born? And generally you can see that those boys may be born two, three, four years apart. Um, then maybe there was a daughter born in the family, so there's no entry for another male. Then you're gonna find more males. So what I did at the beginning of my research was took these male registers and I created the basic, the basic backbone of, of each family with the father's name and the son's names. And that's all I had. That's all I had when I got started. The Demotaloyan helped by filling in the mother's names and of course the daughter's names. So these, these records are your backbone. You cannot, you cannot even begin to put together a family tree without these records. Um, remember also that these records may not be complete, especially those before 1860. And also remember that the years of birth may be off sometimes by a long time, sometimes by several years. Um, however, they are um, a, a proof that your family and those sons were in that village. Even if the years are off somewhat, still you've got the name of the father, you've got the name of the son, you know they were there at that particular time. Now, these records are found on, in Greece at the town halls. Um, and at the archive offices. The Greek archives has a wonderful online website if you can figure out how to navigate it. And we can actually help you with that because we have a handout um, that we will share with you on how to navigate the websites. But many of these um, mail registers are on some of these websites. They are definitely online now at Greek Ancestry and at MyHeritage. So those records are name indexed and searchable and they are an incredible resource for you. People have asked if there's such a thing as a female register or a Mitron Thileon, why didn't they keep track of the women? And the answer is that in some areas they did. 
The problem is that not necessarily all areas did and not necessarily all records have been maintained. When I was in Sparta in, in 2019, um, at, I was at the archives office. I like practically live there every chance I get. One of the clerks came in one day and she said to me, look what I found, look what I found. It was a beautiful book, um, pretty big size. And we opened it up, she said, Carol, it's a Mitron Thileon. It's a female register. And I almost, I, I just could not believe my eyes. And there they were very neatly written, the names of the women, the girls that were born um, in the area of Sparta during this late 1800 period. And um, the, the woman who was working there said to me, I, we didn't even realize that we had this record. We happened to find it among some, some books that we were looking for. So things are out there. It's just a question of making sure that they get unearthed and come to light so that we can take advantage of them. Um, I'm going to move on next to the voter list. And voter lists are an incredible source of res um, resource, resource for us for a couple of reasons. Number one, because they are now online and name searchable. Number two, again, they track males in a family. So you can use the voter list in conjunction with your male registers to form the backbone of your family structures. The first national elections in Greece took place in 1829, right as the revolution was winding up. The people who could vote were Greek men aged 25 who either owned property or had some means, um, some means, some, some money. Now, in 1864, the age changed and it dropped from 25 to 21. So consequently, you can kind of estimate um, when a person uh, was born, even just to be able to have their names and to have this information on this voter list is a huge boon. Um, as I said, lots of times you can find people in voter lists that you're not going to find on mail registers because the voter lists are old, starting back in the mid to late 1800s. And a lot of female registers um, are incomplete during those early years of the government. So these are terrific to have. Um, there are three types of voter lists. The first collection is called the Vlachoyanis collection. It's mostly created in the 1870s, but there's a 30 year span there. And it's the one that you're going to use the most. It's the closest in age to maybe a great grandparent of yours. So that Carol, list, yes. Just wanted to let you know that it's 840 now. Um, oh, okay. Keep track of time. Great, thank you so much. Um, so we're gonna go ahead and uh, just look very quickly at these voter lists. And I'm gonna ask Georgia to jump in for just a minute and tell us a little bit about the project that she was doing with the voter list and why she started it. Georgia? Okay, this will only take a second. You know, back in, I started thinking, when was it? It was 2014, I'm thinking. And Carol and I were talking and we were so excited to have found these voter lists on the GAC Greek archives, okay? Digitized lists, typed, not handwritten. And it was so exciting. Now I don't read Greek, but I can read names. I can read that. And then, um, so I did my village and then I started posting it and people started saying, oh, can you do my village too? Can you do my village too? Which I did. We now have, uh, we then came up with free translations that I had out there for, I counted them today, um, about 250 villages. So they are on the Hellenic Genealogy Geek blog I can, we will post in the resources thing exactly how to get them. But if you go to HellenicGenealogyGeek.com, there's a link for resources for Hellenic genealogy research and um, click on historic general election list, Greek translations, and you'll be able to see all the villages that have been translated and click the link to see the actual translations. Now these are free. So, if you want to look at the ones on my heritage, you have to be a member, right? So um, 
if you want to try to see if these have already been done through the blog here, I haven't done them for years, but go ahead, take a peek and see if you can see your family in there. Thank okay, you, Georgia. Okay, so folks, um, let me just tell you in the last couple of minutes that we have some of the other records that you can look for when you go predominantly on site in Greece. You can go to the archive records at the archive office and you can ask for school records. Um, children who went to elementary school, those records were kept. The archive office has them. You can ask for notary records. These are phenomenal. They're dowries and wills and contracts and agreements between individuals and families. In the notary records is where we're going to find the information about our ancestors that we're, that we're really longing to, to know about. Um, some of these archives have indexes for the notary records, which makes it easier for them to search by surname, but there are thousands of not documents, but thousands of files in archive offices and warehouses that have not yet been indexed or cataloged. So we're looking forward to those coming to light even more. Um, you'll be able to find um, church records. Uh, the church records in the metropolises, which is like an archdiocese, has marriage books um, and marriage documents. These are the records now that we've digitized and are online at, at MyHeritage for Sparta. But you've also got your village churches. You have your baptismal and marriage and death books in the villages. And in order to access those, none of those are online. There's no church office that you can call and ask the clerk to look up something for you. Those types of research need to be done in person. Um, but that's those church records. If you can get to the village and get somebody to introduce you to the priest and you smile and you bring him a box of candy and you tell him that you're here to try to learn more about your, your grandparents and their lives. They're so, these priests are wonderful. I just love working with them and they're, they'll be most accommodating and, and helping to you. So, um, don't forget when you go to Greece to go to the cemeteries. Uh, the gravestones there are, are just beautiful little memorials to families with photos and icons um, and other memorabilia. Families now are buried in common plots so that beautiful white marble is inscribed with the names of the people in the family that are buried there. Um, an unusual source, but an important source of research um, for your more recent um, ancestry in Greece. Remember that there are more war memorials in every village. These are the marble obelisks that have the names of the people, the men who died um, in, in various wars that were fought. And I see my ancestors' names in the villages uh, where they lived. And don't forget to go to the library, look for your village history books. Um, these were usually written by teachers in a village in the summertime when school was out. Uh, if you can find a village history book for your, for your village, you will be um, in wonderful shape. Um, some other records that you can find online are on the handouts that I've given, that we're giving to you. And so with, next time you hear somebody say, oh, there are no records in Greece, they were burned in the war, you can turn around and you can say to them, I know that's not true. So thank you for listening. And we're going to turn the time over to Greg right now for some fun and music and uh, a little break between our sessions. No, we're not. Uh, Carol, it's Sam's turn first. Oh, it's Sam's turn. <laughs> Sam, <laughs> hey, how are you? I'm good, I'm good. I got so into what I was talking about and I, I didn't have my <laughs> screen up to see your handsome face. Welcome. Hi, Sam. Hey, thanks. Can, can everybody see me? Yes. Yes, we can. Yes. Great. All right. Welcome. So. Yes, so um, thank you very much, Carol and Georgia. Um, that was a wonderful presentation. Um, so our next presentation is entitled Why Orthodox Christians Should Do Their Genealogy by Sam Williams, who is with us now. Um, to introduce Sam, Sam is a professional genealogist with a focus on Central Virginia, African American and Greek American research. He received a BA in International Affairs in Spanish from James Madison University and a Master of Divinity from Holy Cross Greek Orthodox School of Theology. Sam works 
as the pastoral assistant at the St. Nicholas Greek Orthodox Church in Virginia Beach, Virginia. We are very excited to have him here with us today. And um, now Sam wanted to ask you, how were you introduced to the Orthodox faith and what factors led to your conversion? Wow, that's a fun question. Yeah. I wasn't expecting that. Um, <laughs> yeah, so it's actually kind of ironic because my water cup today slightly tells the story. So this is uh, the water cup from the Richmond Greek Festival in Richmond, Virginia. And um, so I actually, I was 16 and I went to the Greek festival and realized to my surprise that the Greek festival was hosted by a church. And so I decided to go inside and check it out. And the rest was history. Um, I fell in love and I found a community and I found family in a really beautiful way. Um, so since then, I've, I've been deeply connected to the Greek community and, and really feel adopted by the Greek community. And so for, for today and for this weekend, my work with genealogy in the Greek community, along with my work in the church, really just makes perfect sense. It's giving back to my community. That's awesome. Thanks for sharing that with us. You're welcome. So um, I can, should I go ahead and uh, start with my presentation? I'll do screen share. Yes. All righty. So Let's as go. we said, um, you can all see my presentation? Yes. Great. So I'm going to be talking about why specifically Orthodox Christians should be doing their genealogy. And as I was introduced already, my name is Sam Williams, and I also work as the Orthodox genealogist, connecting families and encountering ancestors. I'm not going to go over who I am and where I come from again, because that was already read, um, but that's a little bit about me. And so what are we going to be looking at? How are we going to be talking in this presentation? Well, the first reason for why Orthodox Christians should do their genealogy is that the Orthodox Church is a community that remembers that we look back at our past, we look back at our traditions in order to have solid ground to move forward with. Second reason that we're going to look at today is that the Orthodox Church has a profound faith in the resurrection of Jesus Christ and of us as well, and therefore the dead are really alive in Christ. Third reason is that the Orthodox Church believes that relationships truly matter and that we're all connected intimately. Now, I want to start with a caveat here, a disclaimer. Now, I recognize that Greeks come from a variety of different faith backgrounds. So neither Greek ancestry nor myself, not, none of us assume that all people of Greek heritage are Orthodox Christians. Rather, we witness to this shared history and experience of Greeks, the Greek state, and the Orthodox Church that informs much of the Greek psyche and culture of today, regardless of one's faith at the present. Now, as an aside and a story of that, uh, one Christmas, my family bought me this Greek cookbook. And I was like, this is so cool. It's Around the Greek Table by Katarina Katsarka Whitley. And it says, arranged according to the liturgical seasons of the Eastern Church. And as I'm going through these really great recipes, not a, you know, a uh, advertisement for her, but when I discovered that the author, while she's Greek, she's from a Greek Protestant background. So even though she's a Protestant, she has organized her cookbook according to the Greek Orthodox liturgical year. What does that tell us? It shows us that so much, not just in Greece, but in uh, cultures that the Greeks were early on present in, we're so much influenced by the Greek Orthodox Church that it's so part of the culture. So a lot of these different things are gonna be familiar to people, even if they are from a Protestant background, a Roman Catholic background, Eastern Rite Catholic, Latter-day Saints, Jehovah's Witnesses, Mormons, uh, Muslims, excuse me, or, or Jewish people as well. All of these individuals that come from a Greek background are gonna be familiar with these Orthodox traditions that influence them. So when I say we, I'm referring to the Orthodox Church, but I recognize that it's not all of us. So we are a community that remembers. As Orthodox Christians, we move forward confidently, only knowing 
where that we're firmly rooted in this tried and true foundation of our past because we know where we're going only because we know where we've been. And that's why in the Orthodox Church, we have such an emphasis on tradition that scripture and the writings of the church fathers are intimately connected as part of the tradition that inspires us and gives us this foundation. We also see this in the, the great doxology, which is that little bit between Orthros and the divine liturgy every Sunday morning, where we sing, blessed are you, O Lord, the God of our fathers, and praised and glorified is your name forever. Amen. It's that God of our fathers that we're constantly remembering in Orthodox worship. And ultimately, we remember many things every divine liturgy, and that's what we're going to be looking at next. In the divine liturgy, we are celebrating a remembrance. We are remembering this moment, this, this moment where Jesus began the, the Holy Eucharist. In We see it here in Luke. Do this in remembrance of me when he's talking to his disciples. And in this celebration, right before the consecration of the gifts, right before uh, we have Holy Communion blessed by the Holy Spirit, the priest says these words. He says, remembering therefore this saving commandment and all that has been done for our, our sake, the cross, the tomb, the resurrection. And he goes on on this list, all these things that we're remembering that happened in the past. But then the priest says something that you might not have recognized or noticed before. He says, remembering the second and glorious coming. That's something that hasn't even happened yet. But somehow, as Orthodox Christians, we're remembering something in the future. So in the Divine Liturgy, we are connected to the past, the present, and the future. There's a timelessness here. And so when we're remembering our ancestors, we also keep in mind this connectedness through the liturgy. Second point, we believe in the resurrection. Now, if we believe that Jesus Christ rose from the dead on the third day, then we also confess our eventual resurrection from the dead at his second coming. Because his resurrection destroyed the power that death had over us. So all baptized Orthodox Christians, we believe, participate in his resurrection. As we sing during the baptism service, and it comes from St. Paul's letter to the Galatians, all those who have been baptized into Christ have put on Christ. And the Lord's body then cannot be broken or divided. So those who have passed on before us, Orthodox Christians do not believe are truly dead, but they're alive in Christ. Because we have a God of the living. And Jesus even reminded the church of this when he said that God said, I'm the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. He is not the God of the dead, but of the living. And he reminded them again of that in Luke 20. And we remember the saints because ultimately Christ has risen, Christos Anesti. And if Christ is risen, then we are just as connected to the living in this life as we are to the departed of our family members and the saints who are also part of that body. We remember the saints like the Virgin Mary in every service, commemorating the holy and pure Lady Theotokos. And then we also say through the intercessions of the Theotokos. And we end every prayer service with through the prayers of our holy fathers. So we're constantly remembering those that came before us in the church. Why should that be any different with our ancestors? We also pray for the departed because, why everybody? Because Christ is risen, Christos Anesi. So we have memorial services to celebrate those who have come before us. And in the Orthodox tradition, we have koliva, which is boiled wheat. And it has spices and it has sugar and it has nuts and all these different seeds that represent how we have to go into the ground in order to rise again, just like a seed. We have this tradition of memorials with koliva on the 40 days after the person dies at one year, two years, and three years traditionally. And then we sing, may their memory be eternal. And a lot of people misunderstand this line. They think that we're saying, may their ancestor or their descendants always remember them. But what the church is really saying is, may God always keep them in his memory which is to say, may they be eternal along in the presence of God. We also have the Trisagion service, 
which is remembering the departed without koliva, either done at the cemetery or at the church. And then we have four Saturdays throughout the year, sought Saturday of Zols, or Sijo Sabato, which are days where we celebrate all of the departed by name. But we also commemorate the departed every divine liturgy. And the first way is in the proskimizi, which is the preparation of the gifts before the divine liturgy, something that the priest does over on the side of the altar uh, during orthros normally. Now, this is the moment where the priest is preparing the offered bread and the offered wine that will be prepared for the Eucharist. But what a lot of people don't realize is that the priest is reading the, the names of the departed and the names of the living that have been offered by the parishioners. So every divine liturgy, the priest is remembering our departed loved ones. And then also during the liturgy at different various moments, the priest is commemorating those that came before us. The priest at one point after the consecration says, we offer you this spiritual worship for those who have reposed in the faith, forefathers, fathers, patriarchs, prophets, and goes on this long list. And then also he says, we, we remember all those who have fallen asleep in the hope of the resurrection. And then he commemorates them by name. And he says, grant them rest, O God, where the light of your countenance keeps watch. And besides the liturgy and memorial services, we also have our personal prayers as the tradition in the Greek Orthodox Church, where we pray in our personal prayers for those that came before us. We pray for them by name in our personal prayers. We can offer up incense in their, in their memory. We can make the koliva that we're going to offer at those memorial services. We can make the prosphora and then offer the names of our departed loved ones when we bring that prosphora, the offering bread, that's going to be used for Holy Communion. And then, of course, when we go to the Divine Liturgy or go to the church to pray, we can light candles for those that have passed on. And more personally, we can ask those that have passed on to pray for us. Because if we remember that Christ is risen and they are alive in Christ, then we can ask them to pray for us as well. Now, our ancestors matter to us because Christ is risen, because Christos Anesi. Just as learning the lives of the saints help us to identify with their lives, so also learning the lives of our ancestors can help us to better emphasize, empathize with their struggles and then lift them up in prayer as well. But guess what? You can't pray for someone if you don't know their name. And this is why, everybody, we have to study our ancestry. You can't pray for someone as my great-great-grandmother. You can only pray for her as Vasiliki. So we have to know their names. Genealogy helps us to discover those names and discover who they were, to flesh out their story, that they're more than just a name or a place and a death, birth, date. And that's because relationships matter. We see that, for example, in the Orthodox wedding service, where the priest says, remember also, Lord our God, the parents who have brought them up. For the prayers of parents make firm the foundation of households. And we tend to think of, you know, weddings, especially in America, as these two people, these lovebirds, they're, they're in love with each other, and that's what this wedding service is about. But in the Orthodox Church, a wedding is really about the uniting of two families, because relationships matter. And we're a church of tight-knit communities. Ask any of the teens, and at least in the United States, we call it Goya, Greek Orthodox Youth of America. Ask any of these Goyans, these youth, what the difference is between their orthodox friendships and their friendships with people at school. And they're always going to say that their church relationships are much stronger because we value our relationships. Now, what are some of those orthodox relationships that have been developed in the Greek Orthodox Church? First off, you know, everyone has an aunt or an uncle that's not really an aunt or an uncle. Or you have cousins that aren't really your cousins, but maybe... When you take a DNA test, they do turn out to be your cousin. And then we have something that's really awesome. And I think it's really a thing that inspires a lot of people is the relationship of having kumbari or having a kumbaro or a kumbara. These are the people who are the sponsors at your wedding, or they might be the parents of your godchild. And this relationship of this, all these different kumbari of the, my cousin's kumbari and their kumbari, their, to their kumbari, now you're all connected to all these people around you. 
And then you also have the relationship with your nuna, your, 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 your godparents. And then, of course, this web of god siblings. And many of you may have heard of this tradition where some people only baptize boys or they only baptize girls. What I mean by that is that they're only the godparent of boys, or they're only the godparent of girls. But have you ever stopped to wonder why that might be? Well, it's because God family are not supposed to marry. And so it's a lot easier to make sure that your God children don't marry if they're all the same gender. And this is because in the Orthodox Church, these relationships, these church relationships of kumbari, of having your nuna or your nuna, these relationships the church values as even higher than blood relationships. And if our relationships matter, then discovering who our ancestors were, we're honoring our relationship with them. And in learning about our ancestors, we're also going to learn about the relationships that they held most dear. We hold all these relationships so important for us. How much so more do we need to learn about our ancestors' relationships? Because if we know about our parents or our grandparents, why don't we know about our grandparents' grandparents? It's a good point for us to think about and to ponder. Now to summarize for us for this evening, we as the Orthodox Church are a church of tradition of looking back in order to stand firm today. And family history or genealogy helps us to discover our family's past in order to better understand our present and where we're going. We're a church that believes firmly in the resurrection of Jesus Christ and in our unity as his body. And if Christ is risen, then our departed live on too. And that calls us to remember them, to know them, to encounter them, and to pray for them. We're a church that values diverse relationships. And if we love the intimate relationships in our orthodox web of kumbari, of cousins, of aunts and uncles, of theas and theos, then we should also value our relationship to our ancestors. And all of this, everybody, why? Because Christos Anesti, because Christ is risen, Alithos Anesti, truly is risen. So thank you for your attention today. And I wanna make sure that everyone has my contact information. Now, this is my email address, orthodoxgenealogist at gmail.com. It should be easy for you to remember that. And my blog, orthodoxgenealogist.blogspot.com. You can also find me at Facebook, facebook.com slash orthodoxgenealogist. And Soson Kirie is my Twitter account. For those that don't know, since I went to Holy Cross, the hymn of the cross is Soson Kirie. So that's where I get my Twitter handle from. And remember, again, I work to encounter ancestors and connect families. So thank you so much for your attention today. Awesome. Thank you so much, Sam. That was a lovely presentation. Um, and thank you everyone who has joined us for um, session one of the International Greek Ancestry Conference. Um, there will now be a 10 minute break before our next session. Uh, during this time, we encourage you all to stay with us um, since Carol will be conducting giveaways and there will be many videos from Greg. Uh, Georgia will be the moderator for the next session called Under the Village Tree. This will be a panel discussion by five individuals who are reconstructing their ancestral villages by building their family trees. They will discuss why they did it, how they did it, and what they have learned along the way. Thank you again, everyone. I'm just going to make a quick comment about the giveaways. So Greg, as Galisandra said, Greg's going to show um, just a little video. It's time to take a break. And in a couple of minutes, I'm going to come back on and I'm going to say, okay, everybody, those of you who are interested in getting three free records from Greek Ancestry, go ahead and type Greek family in the chat in YouTube. And then I'll go ahead and um, I'll just close my eyes and point to my screen and pick the lucky winner. So we'll take a, a break and then we'll be back very shortly. All right, I'm gonna go ahead and I'll admit the guys for the next session real quick. And then I'll bring them into the breakout room and then we'll bring them back in when it's time for the next session. And the lucky winner. So we'll take a break and then we'll be back very shortly. Yeah, okay. Join me in a breakout room real quick. Just 
or join. Join. Ben, can you hear me? Can you hear me, Ben? No? I can't get out of here. I think, do you see join breakout room at the bottom, Georgia? See, on my screen mm -hmm. is um, something that I think Ben is showing. It looks like video clips. Yes, I see that as well. Um, Where do you see breakout room on the bottom there? Uh, like if you move your mouse, does a panel at the bottom, a menu come up where it says like, uh, where you went to share your screen? Is there a join breakout room button near there? Breakout rooms. Oh my God, you are a pro. <laughs> Thank you. It was nice meeting you, Alexandra. We have yes, to talk nice again. Yes, nice meeting you to Georgia. Okay. Yes, absolutely. Hey, sorry, I was a little bit behind. It looks like you just barely got her into the breakout room. I'll be right back.
Okay, everybody, welcome back. We have, I hope you had a nice little break. Um, we've been chatting with the people coming up for the next session in the breakout room. And it's just so fun to see everybody. It's, it's wonderful to connect. And it's just so heartwarming to make so many new friends. Um, even those around the world in Australia, for me, I'm in the DC area and in, in, um, in the US. Okay, so before we start the session, some lucky person is going to get three free records from Gregory for my, um, off the, my uh, excuse me, the Greek Ancestry um, website. So you're going to watch me do this. I have a live stream on my laptop and I've got the chat up and there are a lot of people that are typing Greek family in the chat. So I'm gonna close my eyes and just point. And the first name that I come to, I'm gonna call out your name. And then what you need to do is, is contact Greg and you can contact him through the GreekAncestry.net website. Um, or you can contact him um, at GreekAncestry at Outlook.com. Okay, so here we go. Three, two, one, point. And the winner is, Oh, gotta put my glasses on. Ah, the winner is Francis Grites, G-R-E-T-E-S, Francis Grites. Um, you are the winner of the three Greek records. So congratulations. Um, if your family's from Sparta, yay. I, I, uh, that Gretas is a name from Sparta, actually um, a name in my family. So um, if you're from Sparta and you're researching in Sparta, you're going to have a ball uh, researching on Greek ancestry. And if you're not from Sparta, there are so many other records and collections there that I know that you'll enjoy learning more about one of your ancestors. So Gregory, Francis, greet us. Thank you, Carol. You're Francis welcome. Francis will take good care of you. As Carol said, you can, um, so please reach out to, to me uh, through the website or uh, on Facebook, Instagram, or just by email, greekancestry at outlook.com. I think we are ready to, to start the second session. Um, And Ben will bring everyone into this room now. Hello, Tom. Hi. Can you see me? Yeah, we can see you, Tom. Okay. Hi, Dimitri. Hi, Stelio. 
I'm moving, I'm moving, I'm moving the, the, the screen around, that's all. Okay, better. Okay, so are we streaming live now, Gregory? Yes, we are. We're just missing Chris Service. I think he's over on the side here, isn't he? There's an arrow there. No, you're right. Hello, Ben. Thank you for hosting. Gregory, I'm going to start. How about Chris? Is Chris available? I'm sure he will be. No, I've, I've got him taking care of that. down the no road. Worries. OK. First of all, welcome to our second session under the village tree. So you can reconstruct um, a village using your family trees. I'm Georgia Kyleman, and I'm back again. So this time to moderate this discussion. Look at countless Greek villages have no written history books. Down the road. Okay. First of all, welcome to our second session under the village tree. So you can reconstruct um, a village using your family trees. I'm George. I'm I'm Somebody's Thanks. playing the video, well, not the. I to moderate this discussion. Look at countless Greek villages have no written history books. Down the road. The YouTube link on their computer, so we we'll want to make sure that gets closed out before uh, before we get going, just so that way the stream's not playing in the background. Okay, I'm not hearing the audio in the background now. Okay. Be okay. Real quick, Chris, can I have you unmute yourself? Awesome. Okay, I think we're all here, and I'm not hearing the background audio, so I think we should be in business. Okay, I'm not hearing the audio in the background now. I think somebody's sure? the YouTube video okay. pulled up. Okay. Be okay. Real quick, Chris. the background audio, so I think we should be in business. The you YouTube okay link pulled I'll up on the audio computer. in the background now. I think somebody is sure? the YouTube video okay. pulled up. Okay. Be okay. Real quick, Chris. Do you want to, do you want me to go mute? The background audio, so I think we should be in business. No, What's don't going on is I think we don't have the audio. So you want to make sure you close out of that. So, you know, do you want to? Do you want me to go mute? Background audio. So I think we should be in business. No, What's going on? Is I think we have a So you want to make sure you close out of that. Who are you talking to, Ben? Uh, ben, can you can you please send Chris into the breakout room so that you can fix the? Click on that button to the that says breakout rooms when you move your mouse inside Zoom. When you do that, there'll be a thing that'll say setup and waiting room, and then when you hover over that, there'll be a button that says join that you can click on. Let's go in there and let's see if we can figure out the audio from there. I think the problem is that YouTube video is still going in the background. So we got to figure out who has it on their computer so we can get that turned off. Ben, can you send Chris into the breakout room now? Can you do it automatically? Right now, but since he's back in, I think I need to have him manually click on the button again. 
Go to screen. I think it might have been us. We had the good shot. Ben, can you send Chris into the breakout room now? So I'm. Can you do it automatically? Right now, but since he's back in, I think I need to have him manually click on the button again. In the breakout room? Go ahead and click on that real quick if you do. There we go. Okay, Georgia. Yes. You, you can start over maybe. No, and... I'll, I'll, I'll abbreviate it, okay? Okay. So we have um, panelists today that have done their ancestral villages and beyond. And we will discuss what they did, how they did it, and what they have learned along the way. So first, let me introduce them. Our panels are Stelios Halyas and Demetrius Katsambas. And they are associated with the Tribal Pages website, Family Trees of Southern Parnon, which was started in 2002 and currently contains 45,690 people and growing all the time. I've been a big fan for a long time. Then we have Tom Frangoulis, who's been working since 2010 on a family tree associated with the village, uh, village in Lefkada. We have Chris Zervis, who started his research in the village of Prosimna Argolides and has expanded to surrounding villages. His tree is currently approaching 65,000 people. And then we have Carol Kostakis Petranik, and she's been focused on Ioyanis, Sparta. That's where all three of her grandparents came from. And one of my grandparents came from there also. So I have now joined her to work on this project. So let me start with um, the uh, family trees of Southern Parnon. Now, Demetrius, I understand you were the one that started this project. Is that true? Back in around 2002? It was a joint effort in essence uh, all around. Um, let me just say that I was didn't set out to be involved in a project of this magnitude. Um, there was never the intention. I was more interested in documenting the history of uh, my ancestral village and publishing a small booklet. It seems to be a tradition uh, in Greece that uh, teachers do quite a bit of research wherever they go. And a lot of local histories are written by teachers. I've noticed that. <laughs> yes, um, well, I was born in Karitsa and left as a very young boy. Um, I returned much later and uh, felt a spiritual connection uh, with the place, a revelation. Um, so I did a fair bit of research. And as I say, uh, the intention was ne never to branch into family trees. I was more interested in researching and documenting um, how my folk, my ancestors uh, eked out a living in, at times, a hostile environment, a very, very difficult environment. I wanted to research um, education in the area and the development of the community over time. Some of that led on to clans, and as uh, Carol pointed out in an earlier session, uh, one of the first important records uh, was post-liberation. After the revolution of 1821, uh, we find that the village was peopled by no more than 20 families. Wow. And we began documenting the clans, actually, and that led to um, branch it out into charting family trees. We initially wrote out uh, a description of the clans and that is published online bilingually. At about that time, um, which is early 2000s, um, I joined up with, with Stadio. So I had uh, charted around 100 
uh, family members. And that was basically my main input until Stelios came on board. And then we began to fly. Here was a person that, um, a chemist background, but he had an incredible ability that I didn't to visualize patterns and to put together data that seemed to be random and by chance and make some sense of that in terms of family trees. Now, I don't want to steal his thunder. He has been the single most important driving force um, of family trees. First of Garitza and then extend into Southern Panon. So thank you, Stephen, for your efforts. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, I, uh, I... No, go on. Go on. No, I... I before 2002, I was uh, humming and hiring about doing just my immediate family, my mother and my father, but I, I never got around to it. That would have been taken five or six years and I come to Dimitri's house and I said, I need some help because I, I, I didn't know how to go about it. And he shows me the website, Tribal Pages. And it, it just went from there. And uh, I said I needed to start interviewing. And that's when, actually from no knowledge about anything. So I, luckily there were enough uh, elderly people here in Adelaide that we could make a start. And most of the people I did interview would have been late 80s, 90s. And most of them I would have interviewed 20, 30 times. Uh, so this is about, say about three or four of the, because not, not all the people can help you. It's, it's, you have to be a special kind of person with a special kind of memory. And their recall is such that they're a great use. And I just, and at the time I, I had a voice recorder and they were on a little tape deck and that wasn't, it didn't take a lot, but uh, as time went on, the voice recorders got better and that's how it started. And uh, we, from 2002, we started getting uh, other members. Uh, we've got, we got John from Athens. These are people with a Karitsa connection John was a computer uh, programmer for Olympic. Uh, and he, he had his own family tree and he put it, and I put it onto the database. Of, I think he may have done it as well because he is proficient at English. And John is the person who went to uh, Karitsa and we, I, don't, I can't remember if it was off his own bat, but he, he started searching for church records. Mm. This would have been mm. 2000 and, uh, Four, 2005, and he managed to find uh, school records uh, that were unfortunately just found on the ground, littering the place. There, no care had been taken. We were lucky to find uh, church records from 1860 that were in good condition, but they had been just discarded. Uh, they were not sorted. They, they were, were not. They the, were just they, all over the place. All over the place, and you wouldn't know what was what. Anyway, he was very methodical. Was John, and uh, mm. after that, uh, the first few years, we uh, we actually got Gregory. He came on mm. as a a very young man in uh, two thousand nine mm. or something. He would have been fifteen. Wow. So, and Gregory was, is, as you know, is from Yeraki in Laconia, and by this time we start, we realised that we couldn't call it uh, Karitsa family trees anymore because you can't study one village parochially. It has to be connected with the surrounding villages and uh, that's when we gave it the initially, name. Initially we, thought, initially we thought that it was going to be um, not as a daunting task because we thought, oh, small village, we're all pretty much um, related, uh, but geez, in very short time, uh, the uh, interconnectedness of people, the humanity of people, uh, the tentacles of it, if I can call it that, uh, reached the world over. 
the United States, uh, South Africa, Britain, uh, all over. So this tiny village in um, the slopes of, uh, of a mountain uh, had a real and living connections uh, with the rest of the world, um, which um, we kind of suspected, but we did not think it was at the magnitude that uh, it became. Um, the internet uh, was uh, such an important factor in all of this because by the 2000s, um, the internet both as um, an entertainment and data uh, source um, was common every day. We've been, the internet has been with us for more than a generation now. It seems like yesterday, but... Um, it does, doesn't it? <laughs> oh, yes, for, all, for some of us. Um, family trees and of Southern Parnon uh, that, that Stelios worked on had three very, very important factors that suited all of us and most team players. One was that um, we could enter families and develop relationships very, very clear, uh, develop charts of kinship. The other one was a particular love of mine was that you had the ability to write stories, family stories and anecdotes. It, from my view, from my background, anecdotes say so much about uh, the people, the way they lived, what was important to them, their spiritual life, um, their struggle for survival. Um, and another key element was photographs. Photographs say so much, more than a thousand words, they say. Right. And um, the collection of rare photographs was something that we were on about from the beginning, which has proved to be, um, yeah, a great learning uh, for all of us. And uh, to the extent that uh, that, um, that feeling is permeated to the whole village, the whole village now is uh, sending us photographs. Um, oh, see, that's very interesting. You've got them I, all involved in this now. That's yeah, so wonderful. it's not just... Mm. Right. That's great. Um, another uh, method of uh, information gathering that you haven't mentioned, I actually started writing a cover letter on an industrial scale. This mm. would have been when there was not much information on the internet, so I would have had hundreds of letters... And because our village has got um, surnames that are unique, you can't do it with a more common name, like uh, like in English you'd have Smith and that. But the ones that you know that are, say, from Ayo Yani, but from our case, Garitza, I would do everybody in America with that name uh, and I would send them. And if I got two replies out of ten... That would be a gold mine. That, for me. That's a great idea. Yeah. That's really good. So Carol, keep that in mind. No. <laughs> so that was one I, I, I thought up myself. And, I, and I've still got all the letters that they sent me back. And they gave me a connection. And they sent me a later the mm. email addresses and things like that. That's wonderful. So now people can actually go to the tree by what? Searching on, on Google, they can go in and search for tribal pages and then, and Southern then, um, and then what? Parnon? If they say family trees of Southern Parnon, it okay. comes up. Okay. And we'll publish There is a little bit of a trick to it, uh, Georgia, that we need to reveal. Uh, most of these trees have um, um, passwords that could get into. Um, both Stella and I uh, do not see the family tree of, of Southern Pardon as something private. We see it as, as public property and we freely uh, pass on um, the access code, which is P A R N O N, quite obviously. Just the name of the mountain. <laughs> oh, that's yes. secret. Okay, we won't let that out. That's a big secret. That's a secret. <laughs> 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 So how many people actually belong to your group, your tree? Our of, group, uh, membership. our team is a very numerous, a very, uh, many, many. Uh, we see that um, the whole process 
we see as a journey and a beautiful journey. Um, we're on a train. Over, sorry, over time, there would be about what we call co-coordinators, about six. Yes. Some of them are some of them are pretty busy people. They might be a lawyer or something like that, and they can't. But whenever they can, they send information, and they and in a lot of cases they enter it themselves because they got the password to actually edit, and so they can get in. You're the coordinator. There are some key people that enter, but they don't have to tell me. But sometimes they do. But they, yeah. But there are many, many more. Um, contributors that we rely on. There are some people that are not computer, computer literate whose um, contribution in the team has been so invaluable. There was the 90 year old um, lady that came to live in Adelaide and sp they just spent incredible That was my time. first big interview, yeah. Yes. Um, there's uh, the Agrophilicus of the village. He was in that job for 40 years, knows of the area better than anyone else, and including people. His great delight is to get a telephone call from Stelio or I to check a, a church record and will say, by tomorrow, you will have it. Um, wow. Yeah, it's, it's a team. It's like it's a like train journey. Um, there are people that get on and people get off, that get off. There are people that get off and sometimes come back on again. Um, we value uh, the... I mean, I just say very quickly. There are people uh, who have also done uh, very. You don't see them on the internet, but they have done them. Like uh, the the history of in the Chinuria, which is mm. northern Laconia in Ar Arcadia, uh, the former finance minister of Greece, uh, Karbouvelis, he sent me his uh, family, and I have actually entered it because it connects very well with Yerati, with Karitsa, with all those villages on the slope of uh, Parna. Uh, it, as we go towards Leonidi, we've got uh, Titalia. There's another bloke there, uh, Yanis Sari. He has, uh, together, we have documented just about the whole Saris, which is the last, which is the largest family name that I know of. It's, mm. it's over a thousand people. Even down in, um, there were people in Adelaide that I, uh, coordinated with to do, say, Wuves, Apidia, Ayo Dimitri, uh, but you don't see them on the internet. They And one big one is in Sydney, there's a man, Tom Kokoris, he's from Richia. Mm. Uh, he has got about 40, 45,000 names. He, he doesn't go on the internet, but he has got, it's a private, but he freely shares information with me. Uh, and there's, there's a, quite a number of people in that range of, but we don't wow. know about there's, Sharing is so important. It is. There's a dominant uh, ideology of the, the site, by the way. And that's how it built. It's, yep. These people have given me the information. That's great. It's very impressive. It really is. Hmm. Thank you very much. This has been our great. Pleasure it and uh, our pleasure to meet so many uh, people and learn so much from people like Tom and Chris and you, Georgia, and meeting you, uh, though virtually, and, and Carol. It, it's always been uh, um, a kind of goal of ours to meet Carol. She's done... Uh, no, she's famous. <laughs> but she's famous. <laughs> so it's a privilege. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, next let's go to Tom Frangoulis. My Hi, DNA everybody. cousin. <laughs> thank you, Georgia, Carol, and Gregory. Thank you very much. I hope everybody appreciates what you guys are doing. I hope they understand that it is not it is not a five minute job. It is it is a commitment, and the commitment is, takes a lot of time. We appreciate it. Okay. Uh, thank you, Georgia. No, thank you. Okay. <laughs> so tell you us about tell us about your project and some of the unexpected things you found along the way. Okay. Uh, I, I was born in, uh, in a small village in, uh, in the island of Lefkas. Uh, it is called the Gluvi, 19, uh, 1945. I left uh, Greece in 1964. And uh, I, came, uh, I came to California to go to school. In about 2010, I, I got very embarrassed because I could not remember my grandmother's name. 
Oh, so that's how it started. Yeah. That's how it started, and uh, and it has reached the point that uh, you know where I am right now. Uh, in the beginning, in the beginning, I start uh, I start collecting uh, information that I had around the house, different pictures from old pictures, uh, wedding certificates, marriage certificates, uh, baptisms, uh, and I found the, I found the shoebox. Inside the shoebox, there were the original letters that my father had sent me. Again, my father passed away in 1975, so I had kept I had kept inside the shoebox his letters, the letters from uh, from uh, from uh, from uh, my friends, and inside my my father's letters that I've read again and again and again, there were certain certain important papers about the, from the army because I had to I had I didn't go to the army I had, you know there were important papers, but at the bottom 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 of the of the shoebox. I had my original tickets from from uh, Piraeus to New York. Please, well, please, uh, from Piraeus to New York, and uh, by by Queen Frederica, and I had the original ticket from Greyhound that I took from New York to San Francisco. Now the trip took about I don't know how many days, but it was a long trip. Just the just the just the, the bus was, but it was important for me to see that these papers were still there. Yes. Um, I go to, 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 to Greece and I visit my, my, my cousin. Uh, she's married to my cousin that he, you know, was, married, was uh, you know, had passed away. And before I left, she says, uh, by the way, I have a box, a box that, uh, that I'm, I'm going I'm to uh, throw away. No. I said, don't throw it away, just give it to me. Now, inside that box, there were, there were important family papers, uh, passports, taftotites, uh, ID cards, driver licenses, and there was, among other things, okay, there was an envelope full of old pictures. Oh, one of those pictures, come true. one of those pictures, one of those pictures was was the picture of my grandfather, and I do believe that this is the only picture that exists of my grandfather. Wow. Now I got to a blue v, about five years ago, and I go to visit my cousin. Uh, he's a second cousin of mine, Andreas Fragulis. Uh, he told me that his father, his father left a chest in the in the basement of the of the of his of the of the, the house. And I go to visit him, and I go down to the basement. I open the chest, and the chest, believe me, it's full of full of newspapers, full of books, full of loose papers. Uh, full of notebooks, no, not, uh, notepads. Some of those of those uh, loose papers, uh, loose papers that he has, it's uh, poems. He's a po he's uh, he was the, the 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 secretary of the village for many years, and at the same time he's a poet. He had written a lot of poems that they had, they were they were uh, they were uh, published, but you know some of them were not were not uh, were not published at all. Anyway, in one of those uh, of those not not. A part that I saw, it was full of history about the village, and the history had to do with uh, with uh, the people that uh, they, they lived there, the, the the number of people that uh, that they they, they 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 were every year, how many how many uh, men, how many uh, uh, women. It was very very interesting. But what was more and more important to me was uh, was uh, a notebook that had just five 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 pages. That's all. That's all he had written. But believe me, in those five pages. He had the horse history, history of now he, he's my 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 uncle. He's my you know the, he's the, the first cousin of my of my father. So his family is, is my family. But he has in, in five pages, he has all the information about the family. And the family goes back to something, something you know, 1750, 1770, 1780. That's how much information he had, but everything was written. With uh, with nicknames, I mean, he called somebody Cocolo. Okay, it took me years to, years to realize that Cocolos is Nicholas in Greece. It took me years to years to find out he's referring to somebody somebody as Scorpios, Scorpios Fragulis. It took me years to realize who's Scorpios. I mean, you know, what, what name is this? Anyway, the 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 thing is full of uh, full of uh, full of information, and uh, I told Carol, uh, I told Carol earlier. Uh, that uh, there were some un unwanted, unwanted gifts from unwanted visitors. 
that they were chewing all this all this information that uh, you know that that was there. Uh, by the way, those those uh, those uh, those uh, those those uh, poems, I, I took them, I worked on them, I spent three years. Uh, we published a book, and and the proceeds from the book go to the to a museum that they are trying to build in you know in in the village in Egnuvi. So something will, you know really happen over there. Um, in, uh, in, uh, in about three years ago, four years ago, the priest of, uh, of the church in the Gluvi and the person who was taking care of the, of the church, they let me go into the church and, uh, and look, look at the chest, at, at, the, at the bookcase that they had. The bookcase again, you know, had a lot of visitors, but it was full of books, old books, mass books, church books, and one of them, one of them, the date, the date is 1691. Uh, oh my gosh. Yes. The date on that book. I don't know if I had how the word is, it is called Minier. And what it is, what it is, they, they were, they, they, I guess the churches were buying books uh, every month and, and they, they, had, they had a mass for every day. That was Minier, and they were uh, they were for January this year, February, March, April, May. So they were they were every month there was a separate book, and this one particular book, as I said, was uh, was uh, was uh, uh, 1691. Now inside the inside there there were a lot of loose papers. Uh, some of those uh, papers were uh, were to me very 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 important. Uh, they had they had lists of the parishioners. List of the properties that uh, that uh, the, the the church had, but in one paper, in one one paper, uh, it it is an old an old book, just just a paper, just a paper from one old book, but that paper was very important because in one, that paper was the baptisms of uh, of that particular year, and one of the baptisms was my father's baptism. Oh wow! So I'm holding on my hand. I'm holding on my hand. The baptism of my 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 father in in 1906. Now I will go a step further, which is much more difficult to believe and understand. In another piece of paper, there are there are seven seven wedding certificates or uh, wedding entries written in in both sides of the paper. I've read them. It is the wedding the wedding entry of my great grandfather in 1853. Now try to understand how much information that piece of paper, and again, it's, it's one paper for the whole book, how much information that piece of paper gave me, but not only information, it's proof. I know that his name was Anastasios. I know that he, 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 he got married at, at, at uh, Anastasia Fragulikoga. I know her father and, and her grandfather because the, the, the wedding took place at their house. So there, there is way too much information that it was there. Now, why do I say that? I hope, I hope that, that we look at the chests and we don't throw them away. And I hope we look, we look and keep and keep and keep what, what is, is important. No, that's again, wonderful. Yeah. I agree. Oh my gosh. So do you have when did you start building this into a tree? All this information. I started I started, I started in uh, in uh, in uh, 2010. And do you have that tree is it online somewhere or is it something you just uh, have? The 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 tree the tree the tree has taken has taken a life of its own uh, because right now right now uh, I, 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 I have, I have my, my family tree going back to 1700, to 16, actually 16, 1690 or something. Uh, I have proof, I have proof, you know, weddings and, and marriages and all that going back. But uh, I, I have expanded to the family trees of all the villages and all the, all the, all the, the and all the people in the fam in the, in the, in the, in the village. So if somebody wanted to, do you have um, a, a, a list that you can publish or give of like all the surnames or something where somebody, if somebody wanted to get in touch with you so they could, okay. you know. My, 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 my whole research, uh, research uh, Georgia, is, uh, is uh, to provide information for other people to create their own, their own, uh, their own, uh, their own uh, family, family tree. trees. Yeah. 
Uh, I can go to the village right now, and believe me, I've gone, I've gone to the villages, and in the beginning, they will not trust me. Uh, I had a hard time, you know, the, 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 the getting people to trust me. Right now, I go to the village. Not only they trust me, but they, they offer information, as, uh, as Dimitri said earlier. They offer information to me. Before, they would not let me take their picture. Now, they come, they come in with, uh, with, uh, with uh, envelopes full of pictures that, you know, I can take pictures of them and, and return them. But they come and ask me to build their, their family tree. And I can build a family tree, a family tree going back to 1800, provided wow. they, give me, they give me some information. I'm lucky, Georgia. I'm lucky because, uh, because, uh, because uh, you guys are talking about information uh, starting in 1900. And I'm talking about information starting in 1700. Listen, I know. I know. I've been listening to you. Yeah, That's yeah, amazing. Yeah, yeah. It is amazing. Yeah, but, but but again 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 the 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 uh, the archbishop of the churches in Le, in in Lefkas gave an order, and the order was was for 1695, that all the churches that they belong they belong to the metropolis, they had to they had to keep uh, uh, records of the marriages, the deaths, and and uh, and the births the births, the births. The deaths and the marriages of all the, all, 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 you know, a separate, a separate, a separate, a each, each, each church. Uh, I have records that they start in 1775, three different churches, three different books of records. Uh, they start in 1775. The records that I have, they start from 1775, they go to, they go up to 19, let's say 80. But just, just, just the, 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 the baptism records, the baptism books, I, I, you know, I should not say records, the baptism books that I have scanned, there are 35 from, from 1770, just the baptism. Wow. Uh, when I say scanned, I mean, I mean, I mean either, either scanned, scanned it really or I took pictures of them. And then, you know, you know through Photoshop, I, I am I'm able to 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 work them and 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 uh, but then you know between the the baptism records the marriage records the marriage records I have about twenty five books from uh, from eighteen hundred to to, to nineteen fifty uh, up to, you know the you were talking earlier about about the the the, the Mitro Arenon Mit, uh, uh, Carol said something earlier Lefkas Lefkas was under different occupation for many 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 years. We were under the Ottomans from uh, 1470 to 16 something. We were under the Venetians from uh, from uh, 16 uh, something to 17 to, to to the early early 17. It was it was it was we were under under a lot of different different uh, different uh, you know uh, people, but we joined Greece, Lefkas, and the Ionian, Ionian Islands. They joined Greece 1868. So the first, the first, uh, the first uh, time that they voted in, you know, with uh, the elections in, in Greece, and they need, there was a need for uh, for the electoral, the, re, the electoral lists was 1869 and 1875. The Mitro Arenon was uh, was uh, was uh, started in uh, in uh, 1870 1879, and I don't think I don't think I don't remember if uh, if uh, Carol hit it earlier. Uh, you had to be 40 in order to be listed. So this, these lists that I have, by the way, for the whole the whole island of Lefkas, for all the villages, this list start in 17 uh, in 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 18 in 1839. That's so amazing. I do have all those lists, and I have worked I have worked almost all of them. Uh, I want to re I want to, pre to 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 protect. I saw yes. I saw what Carol had. Yes. Yeah, so this has been very interesting. You've done a lot of wonderful work. And um, I'm glad you're my cousin. <laughs> <laughs> no, but again, 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 uh, again, uh, Georgia, uh, where do we go from now? And, uh, and uh, you know, what I like, I like to be able to do is, uh, is uh, as I said, uh, I have a book for every, every, every family. Uh, I'm collecting. I'm wow. collecting pictures. I'm collecting pictures, and believe me, I can do it. I can do it because because I have I have the records from th from early 1900s. I have the records from from uh, from uh, uh, late 1700s. 
I can connect those two with the help of, of the, 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 the other the marriages and the best that I have in between. But, you know, with, with the, the, the uh, lists, the, the electoral lists and the metro arena on the, the, the mail list, I can do that. But in a Gluvi, in, a, in a 1766 to 1790, there was, there was a notary that, uh, that uh, wrote seven books. Now, those seven books, as you know, Carol hit it earlier, if you wanna, if you wanna learn how the families would live, if you wanna learn the pain, if you wanna learn, learn a lot of the history, that's what you should read. And that's where the, that's where the story, that's where the story, the real story is. In a will, okay, let's take a will. A will has to, has to have a family. So automatically you get, you get a feeling of the family, you have a family tree. Uh, that family tree, you most likely I'll be able to connect it because it is written in 1760s, 1770. I, ca I can connect them with the births that I have for that part for those particular years. Oh, uh, that's great! Yeah, I, 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 it's just wonderful. You've let done a great say, job. Yeah, let me say something about the will. Okay, the wills to begin with, it is a, it is a misleading, misleading. That that to okay. Let me rephrase it. In the wills is the, almost the first time that you see you see a, a, a female a female uh, referred to. There are many reasons, and one of the reasons is that that if there is a will, the husband writes his own will, the wife writes her own will, because the diary, the the properties that she got from her husband belong to her. Oh, very interesting. Very, very interesting. They belong very to her. That's that's why when you go to, when you when you see when you uh, you, you read uh, uh, dowry dowry uh, agreements, uh, precosifona, the husband and the wife are there because the husband cannot cannot give to the girl cannot give to the girl something that belongs to the to the to the to, to his wife. She has to be there to shine that she's, uh, she's you know, women's she's rights started with you guys right back then, right? That's what right on. <laughs> okay. Um, I think we need to move on to Chris. So Chris, unmute your um, yeah. thing. There we go. Hi. So Hi. You have been working for quite a while. I understand you've got 65,000 people in your tree. Tell us what is oh, going uh, on. Uh, so thank you for allowing me to participate and share my journey on creating. Oh, no, I can't wait to hear it. Family tree. I uh, really appreciate it. So, um, so I was born in a village called Prosimni, also known as Berbati in Arvolida, which is, as far as I'm concerned, is considered the center of the universe. <laughs> Just have to say, I just have to say that. But another thing that I should mention, bring up to you, George and Carol is, and it's very important. I talked about my village being Prosimni, but also called Verbati. So one of the things that you might want to consider is creating a link and that, and that is available of the names of the villages and how they have changed in the past couple hundred years. I think that would be very helpful to, to everyone. So getting back to me, I initially started creating the Zervas family tree back, um, it started in 1982, uh, typically when there's a funeral wedding or something like that, everybody gets together and then they talk about old times and things like that. So in this particular case- Wait a minute, my, go back, 1982? That you started? How many? <laughs> That's a long time ago, okay? <laughs> it was a long time, but I took a break for quite a few years. But okay. uh, so it was my grandfather's funeral in Bellingham, Washington. And uh, there were a number of people there the night before. Uh, and so the conversations were, again, family members and things like that. So I decided to put everything in writing. Um, there was my mother, my aunt and uncle George and Dimitria, uh, Dimitrios Papasotiriu, but there was some, my aunt that lived in Portland, Oregon. Her name was Helen Sotiriu Goritzas. She was at that time, she was like in the mid-80s. Mid she was extremely sharp. Um, 
and she ended up, she lived until the ripe age of 102. Wow. That night, I was able to document the Zerba side of the family that went back to literally around 18, 10, 18, 15. Um, so not only that, but all the, all the kids, their spouses, um, their kids, and so on and so on. So basically, up until 1982, I had the entire um, Zerba side of the family. Um, the other wow. thing that I tried to do there and, and I was capturing was the nicknames of each individual. And that, was, that became very important later on as my tree expanded to include the entire village. Uh, because there were individuals that had exactly the same name. Uh, just like me, Christos Anastasius Zervas, Chris Tom Zervas, uh, there were like two or three with the same name. But I kept finding the same situation again and again. So to help me out to figure out who was who in this whole zoo in the village, um, I created this matrix, which was the last names of the village, and then all the associated nicknames by each, uh, by each last name. So that helped a lot because not only uh, the ages, but some of them were 100 years, 100 years apart. So nicknames really came out um, uh, to be extremely helpful as part of my uh, project. Um, the other thing that I utilized as part of this effort was uh, all kinds of public records that I could get access to. Uh, the voter registration records of 1844, 65, 75, 1983. Again, what I did with these records, I converted them into Excel spreadsheets, and then I started sorting them differently to figure out who was who. And you know, earlier, Georgia, you mentioned, you know, um, and Carol, again, the, the uh, age when the individuals were born, they're never the same from one record to the next. So you had to use, so I used that sorting method in order to figure out uh, who the, the individual actually was. The other thing that I used were some of the court records that were able that I was able to find from Nafleon and Argos. So I was able to get some information about individuals, about different cases and things like that, that I had access to. Um, then there were some school records, but most of them started like from the 1920s, which listed the children, but also the parents and the maiden names of the mother, for example. So that really um, was pretty helpful. Although limited, it really helped a lot. Then there were the birth records, death records, and wedding records from the church. Um, the problem there that I ran into, there were a lot of books from in, uh, that had information starting from around, I think it was 1906 in the village. Uh, when I try to open the very first book, um, I didn't want to touch it because it was ready to crumble. Uh, as you can imagine, a very old book. Uh, it's been through heat, cold weather, humidity, dryness, and all that kind of stuff. So um, I really didn't want to touch these, uh, these books um, and destroy them. So. The other thing that I did, which helped me a lot, and Georgia, you mentioned this earlier, and that is personal interviews. So over the years, I have spent thousands of hours interviewing different people. And, and the reason for that is you get to know, you get a lot of details, you get stories about the individuals. And I take that, that information, the stories, and I also include them in the notes in my family tree. So in, in addition to just the individual, when they were born and all that kind of stuff, who their parents were and all that, um, in, in a lot of cases, there's a little history about the individuals. Uh, it's interesting because across all of us, all of you too, to presenting here, the stories are the most important. Oh. If all we have is just like dates, and names, 
It's nothing. It's the stories that tie it all together and the interviews that all of you have done. It's really um, a common thread. Yeah, you're absolutely right. The, the other thing that I, because some of the records were not available, um, uh, especially with the males, um, I would talk to them and they say, oh, and so I would ask them, okay, so when did you go to the army? And they said, oh, I went such and such. Uh, time and there was so on and so on and so on. They would identify everybody in the village that they were in the same group that went. So that gave me an indication also, uh, since I didn't have birth records, I could use that uh, with a fairly, fairly good accuracy when these guys were born. Um, the other thing with these individuals, they told me stories about, oh yeah, they, they had three other kids, but one died such and such time. They were young and all this. So I was able to get that kind of information as part of the interviews. Um, and then, you know, sometimes you kind of question, okay, why does this kid has the same name as their father yeah. or their yeah. mother? And so, you know, there were a lot of wars, uh, people died while the spouse, let's say the male died, the husband died, the, um, the spouse had a child that wasn't baptized or she was pregnant when he went off to war. So the tradition was, as you can imagine, they took their father's name if, um, if it was a male. So, because um, typically you don't see that very often, but that was one of the reasons for some of the situations. Um, a lot of stories, which was great. Um, the other thing was uh, transportation was not very good, obviously. Uh, there were no roads, uh, 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 just some uh, paths primarily between the villages there. And a lot of the villages where I came uh, from, they're all within three to eight or nine miles apart, very, very close to each other. So uh, there were in situations where some of the people would marry in another village. They, they went as Gabros or Nifi, as it's called bride or groom. Um, and so I try to capture that information. The other thing that I noticed, once there was a single marriage, there were a whole bunch of them, probably proxenia, if you guys have heard the term where, oh, do I have a bride for you? Or do I have a, um, a husband? Yes. For you? And stuff. So there was a lot of that. So that led me to start collecting information about the other villages around there. Um, then um, I started doing, um, so this whole time, all the information that I was putting together was in paper. And then I joined the first century, and then I started that and got into. Uh, uh, I was looking for a particular software, and Ancestry was the one that I came up with, the Ancestry Family Family Tree Maker, and so I started inputting all this data in there. Um, next project was my wife's side of the family, and they're from Gravia and Lidoriki in Fokida, but also my father-in-law's step, uh, stepfather was from a village outside of uh, Tripoli called Paleohorion. Paleohorion was kind of interesting because uh, it was a very large village, yet it was up in the hills, and then all of a sudden, probably 75% of the people immigrated to the States primarily. And they all immigrated, which was very fortunate, around Chicago, <laughs> Spokane, okay. Washington, and Seattle, Washington. So I was able to get a book that was written in the 1940s from the Palehorion community uh, in Chicago that had a lot of information. So start extracting information and populating. That's great. Uh, and then obviously the ancestry records but I was able to get access to their male um, uh, records, birth records, going back to the 18, I think 1830. 
So that was incorporated into a spreadsheet. I started populating more information, the family tree and all that kind of stuff. Um, there was, so I'm, I'm giving you some examples of the kind of information and, and how I access that information. Um, there was another village uh, where my, my dad's sister was married and it's right next to Nartion Calmidea or Gerbisi. Um, and so a lot of information from my uncle about his family, but there were a whole bunch of other people from my village that had married there or back and forth. Um, so I probably had about 30% to 40% of the, the people in my tree. And then I got to meet this individual. His name was um, Christos Konstas. He's an attorney in Athens. And at the time he had done tremendous amount of research and he was in the process of writing a book. So we co coordinated, I shared information, he shared a lot of information. And then sure enough, he published his book. I bought his book, populated my family tree even further and got it pretty close to 100%. And at the same time, bought a whole bunch of his books and gave them to all kinds of relatives here in Seattle, in Portland, in LA, and in other areas just so they know about their families and stuff like that because I was able to get in touch with them. Similarly, there, was, you know, there are a lot of books that have been written with information about specific villages. Now I was interested primarily in the area around my village in Agolida and Corinthia. So anytime I find any kind of book written about those villages, I buy them and then read them and extract information and then populate my tree. Um, there's another village called Stefani in Corinthia, which is very close because we're right at the border between Arbolida and Corinthia. Um, and again, a lot of marriages back and forth um, from our village. So I was able to identify, uh, um, I was given a contact name. Her name is Patricia um, Vanderwell. So Vanderwell. Very Greek. Was, yeah. <laughs> so she lives there, but, and, but now lives in Thessaloniki. And she has put an incredible uh, family tree for the entire village. So she was missing information from my village, so-and-so Katina, but she was from Berbati, for example. Um, that, that kind of stuff. So we coordinated. I shared my, my tree with her. She shared the tree that she had put together. So again, a lot of information that was extracted there uh, and populated into my tree. So next uh, in my bio, I stated that I'm part of this group here in the Seattle area called Greeks in Washington. I know, yeah. <laughs> yeah. So this was an effort that was initiated by John and Joanne Nikon. Um, you know, and part of their effort was to go around to individuals here in the state of Washington and interview them and literally create a miniature family tree about the individuals, both the spouse and uh, both spouses, but also their kids, where they came from, siblings, when they came uh, over here. And so they would publish these write-ups, uh, which are now they're all posted in the Greeks in Washington website. And I'm also a board member now as part of that. But the other thing in these, um, in these write-ups is all these individuals will share their pictures and they're there. But also John and Joanne, the other great thing that they did is they videotaped these interviews, this hour long. Hours See, they're available online, aren't they? They're available on the website. That's exactly right. And so tremendous amount of information. So guess what? Because there are a lot of relatives of mine that came to the state of Washington and Oregon and Vancouver, a lot of commonalities. So I was able to take all those um, write-ups, extract the information and populate the tree because literally it's an extended family and everybody's linked together through marriage or something. Um, the other thing, John was gracious enough to share his tree also, which 
um, I was able to extract information. So right now, you know, another project that I'm doing right now, there's another village called Limnes, which is, you know, less than three kilometers away from ours. Um, so I had, again, a lot of marriages back and forth. Um, I had information from the census record, actually the voter registration records, but also um, I was able to get, Carol, you mentioned, similar to a census record. And between that, so this lady, is, her name is Ageliki Karamanos Frimis. Um, uh, she's from Limnes, but currently lives in Toronto. Um, her and I have spent probably, I don't know, 50, 75, 100 hours on the phone the past few months. But she's a wealth of information. She's in her 70s, and I've been able to spend a lot of time with her and with the data that I had going back and start linking everybody together. Um, uh, and so, you know, she's great. She's very gracious. Um, you know, I don't want to push her too, too far, but she says, you know, I'm going to use the Greek term, which means basically, since we're on the dance floor, might as well finish the dance. Literally. <laughs> <laughs> she says, don't stop. I'm more than happy to help you with anything. So um, oh, that's great. So you know what we've learned from everybody so far is that it's all about connections. Oh, absolutely. Talking to everybody, interviews, and you can't do everything online. You really have to get out there and connect. Exactly. Um, Chris, this has been great. Now, if if your whole tree is on ancestry, yes, it is. Okay. What is how, how what is the name of it? How do we get to it? Uh, it's Chris Zervas, but it's a very lengthy uh, link. But Chris Zervas is a tree. There's two okay. of them. Uh, but yeah, that's great. Thank you so much. Can this I has make been some very interesting. I know I'm dragging this on, but I'd like to make, a, uh, if if possible, if if I can make a couple points. Sure. Is that okay. Yeah. So one, I mentioned about the village names and the changes over the years. Um, the the other, uh, uh, you know, there's a lot of tools out there. A lot of churches have put on a regular basis. Um, um, anniversary books together. Right. And if you look at those, uh, they are a wealth of information because just like John and Joanne, they're miniature family of the families, including pictures. Um, and like um, what everybody said, uh, both Tom and Dimitri and Stelios, um, People are interested in sharing information with you. They really do. And if you encourage them and provide them with information with what you have, which I try to do, um, they're more than happy. It's not uncommon on a weekly basis, many times during the week to get notes from individuals. Can you, hey, can you tell me this? Can you tell me that? Yeah. Um, and all that. But um, thanks for allowing me to share my journey. I'd be more than happy to help anyone out there with information. Um, my email is obviously the center of the universe, which is called Berbati. So it's berbati at yahoo.com. I'm also on Facebook. I'd be more than happy to, to work with you, but also be prepared that I'm going to ask a lot of questions at the same time. So <laughs> Good for you. Thank you very much. That was great. So now, Carol, tell us what you've been up to. Okay. Well, we are we are past ten o'clock, so I'm going to keep this. Really, yeah, but we really got short. we were slow going. But okay, go on. <laughs> That's okay. We were. I I will not take too much time. But unlike my fellow researchers here, I feel like the Lone Ranger. I am doing this myself. Um, it started, um, mm -hmm. I was born in Brooklyn. My extended family was uh, in Brooklyn. I didn't even speak English till I was five years old. And we moved from Brooklyn into um, a cute little community in New Jersey where nobody spoke Greek. So leaving that, leaving that hub of family, and then from New Jersey, we moved to Maryland. 
and I was isolated from all the people, my cousins, my grandparents, everybody. So as my children came along, I wanted them to capture their, I wanted to tell them who their family was and capture that heritage for them. So um, I started like everybody else, you know, letters and asking questions and things, but it wasn't really until about the early 1980s that I was able, after I raised my kids, that I really had the time to jump in and, and start working. And of course there was nothing online then. So it was just the slow snail mail stuff. Um, but I've been very blessed uh, in the last several years to have had opportunities every summer to go to Greece. Um, Gregory, bless him, took me the, for the first time for a real research trip in 2014. I had been there before, but that was my real research trip in 2014. And all it took was walking into the metropolis of Sparta and opening these books that everybody here has talked about and seeing my grandmother, great grandparents' marriage. And that was it. I was hooked. And I just, the bug just hit me to the point where it became a passion for me. Um, so every summer I go to Sparta and I work, I digitize records there. And when I'm not working, I'm either in the cemetery taking pictures of tombstones, or I'm in the archive office, or I'm at the cap office, or I'm in the library, I'm somewhere. So over the last six or seven years, I've gotten just about every extant record that exists for IOC Iwanis, my village right outside of Sparta. Um, the school records, the, all the church books, the, the records we talked about earlier. And from there, I started, as I said earlier, when I was giving my presentation, I, you start with the mail registers, you start with the voting list, you get a skeleton, and then you just start adding those people as they come. So I spend hours every day, literally hours every day, extracting information from the records that I've gotten in Sparta. Um, Greg has a wonderful collection now of some kind of unusual records on his website, the parish voter list, parish census list. So when I said earlier that there's stuff out there, there really, really is. It's just, it's just hidden. Um, unlike my, my fellow researchers here, I don't have a buddy. I don't have people that, are, are, that I can go to or who can help me. I haven't built these networks, but I do have cousins in Ayanis and um, it's, a, it's a joy to be with them. And what I love about it is they, they love it when I visit. And I have dinner with them in the evenings and they say, well, what are you doing tomorrow? And I say, well, I'm going to go to the archives. And they go, wonderful. Come home and tell us what you found. And so it just cracks well, they don't think me up. crazy, huh? Yeah, they, well, they tell me I'm crazy. They call me their crazy American cousin. So all of my work and all of my research, I said to Georgia, as she mentioned earlier, we need to combine our trees. Nobody, unlike some of you that have these village histories or even just a pamphlet, we have Dipota, we have nothing for my Yanis. And it breaks my heart. I go to the village, uh, I go to the Sparta library and there's a whole room with um, shelves and shelves of village books and there's none for my village. So I said to Georgia, we need to do something about this. So I've now created a website really quick. If I can do this, I'm gonna share my screen and show you, hopefully this will come up, um, show you this website that I built for IOC Iwanis or Iyanis. Um, it is, uh, we're gonna put photos, stories, um, village history and family trees up on this site. And in, by doing that, what my hope is, is that this will attract people who will find this a site on a Google search and say, oh, Ayanis, wait a minute, I have family from there or I know somebody from there. And that I can begin, Georgia and I can begin to build a network using this particular website. Um, so just very quickly, you can see across the top, um, actually, let me go down a little bit. You can see the three main um, parts of the website, which are, as I said, the online trees, and when we go into this section here, um, we talk a lot, I have a list of surnames that I've, I've put together from all the records and down here are the trees. So you can click on any of these trees here and it'll take you right to 
those particular for to that tree, wherever it may be on ancestry or my heritage or wherever. Um, for the stories and photos section here, this is where we're gonna have little stories and, and tidbits about the village. So um, what I have here, are, I've just started posting pictures that I've taken during my trips to Ayani's. Um, these are all my photos. Um, and uh, just a little bit underneath each of these about what it is. Um, here's a war memorial we talked about earlier. So I have the names transcribed there. Another one um, with the names transcribed. And uh, so this way, people who can don't know what the village looks like, they've never been there, have the opportunity at least to see a little bit about the village. Um, and then of course, the village families tab. And uh, this is where we're hoping to capture, boy, Tom, I can't believe you have so many hundreds and hundreds of photos. I would love to populate this with hundreds of photos from people right. from Miami's. But um, starting here, just with uh, my family and George's family, and a little bit again, we can write a little bit underneath it so that people, this is a friend of ours um, who also has family from Ayani. So his name is Thomas Condacos or Mikey's. He sent me this picture, I'm thrilled. So we have his family, George's grandparents and family. So basically my dream with this website is to build a connection from people all over the world who have roots in the village. Um, and uh, it's, uh, it's, it's been a dream of mine and thanks to Georgia and her encouragement and having a buddy to work with, um, I feel like it's becoming a reality. So thank you so much for this opportunity to talk a little bit about this. I envy you guys. I love all of you. I love what you're doing. And I think the thing that we all have in common is that we have this, we have this driving passion to just get this stuff documented, get these names extracted, put them in some type of a format. And, you know, it, it's, and it's not just for us. I mean, at this point, Chris and Tom and Demetrius and Stelius, they know who their family are. I know who my family is. I'm not just doing this for me. We are all doing this for you. We are doing this for everybody else out there to try to give them a leg up and a little, um, assistance to get started and a place that they can go to at least try to get um, some support and some encouragement and some tips on how they can find how they can find their families. Um, I just want to close by just saying that I'm really proud of Greg for all the work he's done on Greek ancestry, but he now is going to talk on Sunday at the closing session about a brand new initiative called the Village history project initiative that's going to be sponsored by Greek ancestry and he will give you all the details but that initiative came about as a result of putting this conference together and talking with these wonderful people who are dedicating the best years of their life to documenting their families and reconstructing their villages and what what Greg is hoping to do is to have a central place where all of us and all of you out there, if you're working on a village project, you just send the name of your village, your email address. If you have an online link like Chris, we're gonna tap him right away and get his, his ancestry tree. And we're, it's going to be put on the Greek ancestry um, website so that there's a place that people can go to find a connection. Thanks, Georgia. No, thank you, Carol. And thanks to everybody. This was a wonderful session. Um, I know we ran a little late, but it was important information. <laughs> That's why I'm last in the day. Okay. So, all right, everybody, join us again tomorrow. We are going to have, let me read the schedule here. The 1821 Revolution as Experienced by Your Ancestors with Professor Beaton. Um, we have Yanis Mikalakakos, I didn't say that right, Carol. Um, Mikalakakos. <laughs> life, customs and economy, it's too late, okay? <laughs> then at the end of the day, we have um, Professor Alexander Kitroff, Professor Gonda Von Steen, and Gregory Contros talking about early migrations, settlement, the new land, and some adoption information. 
So, see you guys tomorrow. Everybody have a good night or good morning. Good night. Good night, everybody. Bye. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Thank you.